that's right. Lincoln Parish. Good morning, and thank you so much for being with us this morning. We are so excited that you're with us. A few things before we get started. Me and my team are ready to interact with you, so whether you're watching through the website, through YouTube, or through Facebook, we would love to interact with you. So leave us a comment. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Uh, drop a comment in there for us for prayer. We would love to interact with you. And if you would do us a big favor, you get to play a part in getting this news out to other people. So if you would hit that share button or use some emojis to like different things as the service goes on, that would be really helpful to us. And you can have other people in your community know about what's happening here at Cedar Crest because we're excited about it and we know that you are too. So enjoy the service. We look forward to worshiping with you today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cedar Crest. Can we stand together this morning? Come people of the risen King who delight to bring him praise. We lift our voices to the one who gives us life, gives us breath, our very being. Lift our voices. People of the risen King, we delight to bring Him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of praise. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to
name of Jesus, beautiful. Son of God and one of us, lover of our souls, isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Eternal King, you reign forever, and we will sing the glory of Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Chains are broken when it's spoken, every knee must bow. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Eternal King. every name. He is the one that we need. Let's have a seat and we're going to watch a video from folks out at Seeker Spring who are lifting up the name of Jesus and encouraging them faithfully after him. Hey Cedar Crest, this is Terry Lawson from Seeker Springs. Listen, I want to thank you again for your partnership in God's work here at Seeker Springs. Uh, we just got through celebrating 25 years of ministry uh, a few weeks ago at the end of January. And, uh, man, we are so thankful for what God has done over the course of these 25 years. But we are really excited about where we see him, see him taking us in the future. But you have been a big part of, uh, of God's work here. Um, many students have come through, uh, through camp here. Uh, many have served on staff here. And you as a church as a whole have partnered with us in, in ministry. And we just want to tell you, Well, good morning, Cedar Crest family. We appreciate you being here with us this morning. Um, those of you who are with us here in person, those of you who are joining us online, thanks for uh, joining us here this morning. Um, also, just want to say thank you for your faithfulness and supporting uh, the ministries here at Cedar Crest. Just want to remind you of the ways that you can give. We have our baskets at the front. You can give online. Um, you can give through your life group class. Um, you can come by the church office, you can drop it in the mail. So there's all sorts of ways that, 
you can uh, contribute to Jackson, I want to teach you a new song this morning. Oftentimes, we read about stories of the greats of the Old Testament and don't think about how they connect with Christ and who he was. Colossians says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So many Old Testament stories point the way to Christ, our hope. Listen to these words, and I'll ask you to join us. Christ the true and better. Christ the true and better Adam, Son of God and Son of Man, you intended in the garden, never yielded, never seen, he who makes the many righteous, brings us back to life again. Dying here, burst the curse, then rising, crush the serpent's head. Christ the true and better Isaac, humble son of sacrifice. Who would climb the fearful mountain There to offer up his life Laid with faith upon the altar Father's joy and only son Their salvation was provided Oh, what for? true and better Moses 
called to lead her people home, standing bold to earthly powers, God's great glory to be known, with his arms stretched wide to heaven, see the waters parting to see the veil is torn forever cleansed with blood we pass now through Amen Amen from beginning to end Christ the storm is the glory Hallelujah the true and better David, lowly shepherd, mighty king, he the champion in the battle, where oh death is now thy steed, in our place he He shall be a throne forever. We shall let his people be. Amen, amen. From beginning to the end, Christ the story is the glory. Hallelujah. Together again. Amen, amen. From beginning to end, Christ the story is the glory. Hallelujah. Morning. Morning. It's good to see you. I think I saw most everybody. A few of you came in a little bit late. I may have not seen you, but it's good to see you, even if I didn't get a chance to see you. So we, uh, we're working on our new theme. What's the theme up on the screen? The theme on the screen. Did you notice that? A little rhymation going on this morning. Nothing wrong with that. So we get our stuff lined up here. So have you ever noticed the focus of a professional guy trying to putt you ever notice yes I am left handed just, just so you know actually I'm on the right side of the ball if you stand behind the golf ball I'm on the right side of the ball <laughs> uh, well we do have we do have some things confused I agree you know but not, not in football though <laughs> We, we've got that figured out. <laughs> so it's uh, interesting to me, the, the focus, you know, you watch them. And uh, I haven't watched a lot of golf lately, and now they've got guys playing. I don't even know who they are. And uh, so I was asking somebody the other day, I'm saying, oh, you know about Holt? So, I don't know any of them. So anyway, but, you know, they're on the green, and they're just focused on that ball. And, and one person makes a sound. What do they do? They just back off. And, you know, they're insulted, you know, so... <laughs> They go back up there and they have their routine. You know, they get down behind the ball and look over there and do this, all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and I, I thought about how that is, uh, you know, when you see a baseball player playing baseball, a ball's coming at you 95 miles an hour, everybody's screaming. And you're just ripping the ball, you know. I'm just like, what's the difference there? Well, one, one's kind of a brute strength thing. The other one's a real finesse thing. And so, so you had to have this focus, you know. So 
I'm looking forward. I haven't played much golf in the last couple of years. You know, one of the first things to go is your short game and your putting. So we'll see how that goes. But you can also see it uh, like if you uh, watch football and they have, you know, that camera that's on the field. You ever seen that camera? Uh, Nathan and I went to see uh, Alabama play Arkansas this year. First time I've seen it live. That sucker's just like right there on top of them. And uh, so they give you those shots of the, the quarterback looking, and you can see the focus there in his eyes. He's looking at that defense and seeing how they're lined up and everything, you know, and so it's, uh, it's pretty amazing to watch. So, so that, that focus is there. You've seen it on the, on the, the faces of athletes. If you watch the, the Winter Olympics, I'm not a big Winter Olympics guy, but if you watch it, they're just, man, they're just completely focused in there. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to Dale Greger before he moved to, uh, to uh, Texas, and uh, he liked to read leadership books like I like to read some leadership books. And, and uh, he was telling me that he read, which has been very helpful for me, he said uh, they were telling him that, that the best thing to do when you're trying to work on a project is work for about, focus for about an hour and a half. You know, just really focus on that one product for about 90 minutes. And then get up and take a break. You know, maybe walk around or go do something else for 50 and then come back. And then so that really focused study uh, makes it. So I, I adapted that in my sermon preparation. So I'll, I'll get sit down and, you know, get all the distractions. So for about 90 minutes, I was really focused. And then and I found it to be very help, helpful, that, that focused attention. And uh, I think that's what Paul is doing for us in Colossians 2 is he's, he's helping to focus our attention. Um, there's a title going to come up for the sermon today uh, when it gets there. I, it's not up on the back, so I'm not saying, no, we don't want that, so keep on going. Keep on going. We've already done that. We've already seen that. <laughs> there it is, the right way to walk. So that's what we're talking about today. We could, we could also just title it the fo a focused walk. Actually, it could be entitled that way as well, the right way to walk or a focused walk. And so we, we look at these two verses, and we're, we're working our way through this, this book, learning, learning to Live. It's one thing to, um, to hear about it, and it's one thing to watch them. It's another thing to do it yourself. And so uh, Paul is uh, transitioning. He's pivoting today somewhat here in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And there are, there are a number of things that we can learn from this today. Um, first of all, verses 6 and 7, I don't know if you notice this, but, but that's one sentence. Now, if, you were, if, you're, uh, if you're writing papers today, don't do that. Do we have any English teachers here today? If you're writing papers today, don't use these long sentences, all these commas and stuff. Uh, they prefer a little short, uh, to-the-point sentences. But, but Paul writes this long sentence. It's all one sentence. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, Lord, comma, so walk in him, comma, root and build up in him, and establish in the faith, comma, just as you were taught, comma, abounding in thanksgiving. So that's, that's a mouthful, isn't it? And, and sometimes we read it and we're like, well, that's a neat thought. But we, we don't really take the time we need to see what, it, what is Paul saying? There's some stuff. He, he starts that, um, that sentence with therefore, right? So, so you need to understand he's transitioning for us. Now, have you ever seen a running back running down the field? All of a sudden, they plant a foot and go the other direction so, or a different direction. So Paul, Paul is uh, kind of saying, here's a, here's a transition point. Everything he set up at this point leads up to where he's going from now. So basically, he's letting us know that these two verses set the tone and the pace for the rest of our study in the book of Colossians. He's done some really interesting things so far. He's, he's congratulated them. He's talked about Epiphas, and he's talked to them about them, the, uh, the preeminent, preeminence of Christ. Last week we saw where he, he was encouraging them to be strong. And all that. So now he, he kind of sets that foot, and he pivots a little bit and says, now I want to, this is what I want to talk to you about. He says, I want to talk to you about uh, what, it, what it means to walk with Jesus. It's a similar thing. Let me show you a, a couple of other examples. That Romans chapter 1 Paul does this in a couple of other places. In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he does the same thing after a few introductory comments. He says in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so he spends the rest of the book 
just talking about. That's kind of the, the premise of what he's going to talk about the rest of the whole book. So we see that Paul had a habit of doing this in his writings. And then uh, he does a, a similar thing in Galatians chapter 1, kind of setting the tone there in verse 11 and 12. He says, For I would, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to you by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of a, a, a springboard that he uses to lay out this gospel that he's preaching. So it's a common part of Paul's writing, and we see it right here as well. So, so he's, he's trying to say to us, you, you've learned a lot. Uh, Epaphras has done a good job in teaching you. He, he started this church just sharing the gospel. And a church of form there as more and more people heard about the gospel, which is a, which is a great thing to know. We're, we're asking you to, uh, to find your one for Easter. You know, we have these cards right here on the front down here, and they're in the back as you go out the, the middle doors there. So we're, we're asking you to do something that uh, Epaphras was doing. Find one. Uh, during this holiday, getting ready for Easter, invite them to come and pray for them at 1 p.m. Uh, we had two churches this week who saw it online uh, ask, us, ask us if we could borrow it. I said, well, it's not ours anyway, so you can. So Jarrett graciously took our stuff off of it and sent it to them so they could use it in their church. It's just a, it's just a good reminder that what we see uh, Epaphras doing that we can still do today. We can still invite our friends to come, and we can still share with them about the good news, just like he did to the church here at Colossae. So, so there's, there's a few things that we can pull out of here in this learning to walk correctly. The first one is this, is that you always have to have a secure foundation. You always have to have a secure foundation. Can you say secure? Secure. You know, whenever you're building anything, we'll get to building in a moment, but, but you gotta have, you got to have a good, secure salvation uh, foundation. Uh, for everything in life, and especially for our salvation. And, and in our day, we have to be very crystal clear here. Uh, we have such a, uh, uh, a resurgence of so many different ways uh, to come to know Christ. There's so many different philosophies about how someone can be made right with God. We have to be uh, more clear. You know, in the 50 years ago, pretty much everybody kind of knew that, but over time, there's just been this multiculturalism, which is not a bad thing, that's happened, and they've brought their different ideas about faith. And so for us, we must be very clear about, about a secure foundation. So Paul says, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, that is our foundation. It's interesting, when you look at the flow of the language there, that received idea is something that happens at a moment in time. Now, I, I know some of you here say, well, I've, I've always known Jesus. You know, I grew up in the church. I did, you know, and I've just kind of learned. So, but, but Scripture teaches us that there's a moment when, when you recognize your need. There, there's this moment when, when the Spirit of God opens your eyes to see that you're a sinner. And that's an amazing moment because before that, you don't even realize. You don't even see the need for salvation. But the Spirit of God and His graciousness and His love, He opens our eyes so we can see our lostness. And, and then He shows us our need of repentance. And then once we see that, then we have this opportunity of faith to respond to Him. So we, there must be this moment of receiving. And that's such a crucial part of it because so many people know about it or they, they, uh, they're familiar with it, but, but for, for us today, uh, we're realizing that's not enough. It's not enough to know about Jesus. It's not enough to be familiar with Jesus. The thing is, is have you received him? There must be that actual receiving. So Paul says, here's, here's a secure foundation. That is, you have actually received, you've had that moment. Yes, you may have been growing in understanding. We all do. But, but there's in that point in time where, where your eyes were open to your sinfulness and your need of repentance and you cried out to him in some form or another. You didn't have a magic formula prayer. You just said, God, I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me for that. And I entrust my life to you. And in that moment, it's just like that quick, the Spirit of God comes and gives you life where you're dead. So you have to receive that. And that's such a crucial part. It's important for us to, uh, to understand it because we want to help our friends here. Because you have friends who may be claiming that they're Christians and yet they may not act like they're Christians. Anybody got one of those? You may have a family member that they say, well, I was, I've been in church all my life, 
you know, and, and we're like, well, that's just great. We're glad you've been in church all your life, but, but the question is not have you been in church, you know. The question is have you, have you received Jesus? And so we can help them to understand that, that just being around good people or just being a good person because that's still one of the predominant things you run across people. Well, I'm a, I'm a good person, so I've done enough good that I'm going to be in heaven. But we can't, we can't earn it or achieve it. We can only receive it. Yeah. Woo! I don't even think y'all heard that. <laughs> we can't earn it or achieve it. We can only receive it. Oh, yeah, that's so crucial. That is such a crucial part of this secure foundation for us. And, and we need to be aware of that. It's not enough just to pray a prayer. You know, it's not enough just to walk down the aisle. You've got to dig into that person's life, and you've got to help them understand what it means to become a follower of Jesus, not to be familiar with Jesus, be a follower of Jesus, not to know about Jesus, but to know Jesus. And, and sometimes we may think, well, that's, that's kind, of, uh, it's kind of getting in their space or in their face. But that, that's our place. <laughs> I just thought of that one. You know, if we love somebody enough, if we care about them enough, we'll get in their face. We'll get in their space because we don't want them to miss it. And, and it's so easy for people to ease through life knowing about it, being familiar with it, and yet miss it, you know? So we, we question our children. We question our grandchildren. We talk to our friends because we care about them because we know that that you can't walk with him if you don't know him. And we know that you can't go to heaven unless you know him. We're, we're kind of closing out on Wednesday nights. We started uh, our study through the New Testament for two years, and we're getting closer to the uh, end of Matthew's gospel. And one thing I've noticed, there are several themes that keep coming. One of them is Jesus warns over and over and over about hell. He, he talks more about hell than he does about heaven. And he's like, there will be weeping. And Many times he, in his parables, he's teaching, warning people. So, so that says to me that we must, we must be in some type of mode of talking to our friends about it to make sure they have this secure foundation and to warn them to reject this, to misunderstand this means that you will go to a place where Jesus Christ, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's kind of like LSU watching the national championship game against Alabama. <laughs> you started it. <laughs> See, it, and so, so it's, it's important that we're clear here. You, you received, you understood it. Your eyes were open. You recognized that you were a sinner. Somebody will never ask for forgiveness if they don't realize they're a sinner. Not that they just do bad things, but they're a sinner by nature and by choice, you know. And, and then, and then there, must be, there must be a response. The, the sovereignty of God brings salvation to us, and then he gives us an opportunity to respond. And the church there, Colossus, they had responded. And they had, they had a secure foundation there. It says, just as you receive Christ Jesus, who? The, the, read it. Christ Jesus, the Lord. Yeah. And, and he is, whether we acknowledge it or not, often we talk about trusting Jesus as your Savior. Savior and Lord are somewhat synonymous words. We may need to use that word Lord more. Uh, some people think they can just, just get just, just enough to get in, right? Just, just, I want just enough of Jesus to get in the door. You know what I really want? I still want to do things my way. You know, if you're, if you're here this morning like, well, I, I'm interested in knowing about Jesus, but I still kind of want to do it my way. I'm just saying that he's saying no way to your way. It's all him or none. You know, it's like all in or not at all. That's a secure foundation. We understand that. So it's important that we understand it so we can help our family and friends understand it, that he is Lord. He's the boss. He calls the shots. We live on his agenda. It's his world. We're created by him. We are his creations. We are his children. Those of us who have trusted him by faith, we are his children. And we've said this over and over. Everybody in the world is not his children. That's what, that's what our kind of secular world will say. Well, everybody's a child of God. No, they're not. They're creations of God. 
but you must receive him to become a child of God. And that comes to the place where you recognize your sinfulness, need for repentance, and you cry out to him and you give your life over to him as Lord. You say, I'm no longer boss of my life. And that's tough for us. That's hard for us because we all want to be in control, don't we? All of us want to be in control. To, to humble ourselves, another theme we've seen in Matthew, just to humble yourself like a little child and just trust the Father. Just like you've learned to trust your parents. Hopefully you've been able to trust. Hope you've had good parents that you could trust. One of our enemy's uh, prime uh, ways of destroying faith is to destroy the home so kids don't grow up trusting mom and dad. And if they can't trust their mom and dad earthly, it's harder for them to trust the Heavenly Father who they can't see. That's why it's so important to have moms and dads in the home so they can exemplify the love of Christ. They can make that transfer. So, so Paul says, if you're going to if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to be able to walk with him, this, first of all, you've got to have the basics. You've got to have this secure foundation. And you have received Christ. And so he says, Jesus as Lord. And then he says, so walk in him. So walk in him. Um, I was just kind of racking my brain. What, is, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we go from a, a, from a secure foundation to a steady pace. Say steady pace. So I ran across a guy named uh, James Orr in the International Study Bible Encyclopedia. His, here's how he described the steady pace. He says, this verb for walk uh, is more often used throughout the Old Testament. It's the word halak in the Old Testament and the epistles of the New Testament in a metaphorical way. In this sense, it means to follow a certain course of life or to conduct oneself in a certain way. Many times uh, this verb translated walk is in the present tense, which it is right here, in the Greek of the New Testament, which means that the writer is referring to a continued mode of conduct or behavior. In fact, the infinitive to walk can be translated in a Hebraic way to live. So to walk means to live. And in most every case that you find this in the New Testament, and there are a bunch of them. I probably ran the references on it this week. There's probably 12, 14, 16. That phrase that we sometimes don't really, don't really grasp, we just kind of read through and don't pick up on it. But Paul uses it over and over and over and over and over because it's, it's kind of synonymous with the word abide. Say abide. You know, we talk about our strategy. One of our strategies is to abide in Christ, how to stay connected to him. So Paul says, says walk, walk in him, and we can walk in him because he's in us. You with me? How do we stay in step with him? Because he's inside of us. The moment of conversion, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to live, to abide, to create new life. And, and then to come literally live, he's our, he's our resident president. You with me? He's our resident president. So he says, walk, walk with him, to abide with him, to stay with him. We walk with him because he is in us. We, as, as we walk with him, we see what he sees. We hear what he hears. We act like he would act. You say, well, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, we just come back to one of the most basic principles of, of discipleship, and that is we read and study and meditate and memorize on Scripture. Because as we study Scripture, like we're studying Matthew right now, and, uh, and we're, we're literally walking with, we're walking with the disciples right by Jesus. So we're learning how he would respond. We're learning what he would do, how, how he would have compassion. So, so we can walk with him because we know him, because we have, we have spent and we continue to spend time digesting his word. And that's him speaking to us. He's tutoring us along the way. And then we have this amazing thing called prayer to where we can be in this constant communication with him all day long, all day long, all day long. I was just given a, a new book on prayer. Uh, O.S. Hawkins has one called The Prayer Code. I'm just getting started. I'll share more with you as we go along. And it's like 40 different prayers that we should all pray. It's an, this seems like, like an excellent book. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if we haven't kind of understood studying the Scripture and prayer as an obligation we do rather than how we build our relationship with him how we spend time with him. It's good just to do it, but, but we don't want to do it just simply to do it. Like, check the box, 
No, it's not. That's not. That's not the t- the deal. The deal is that we we understand this is literally word of God. This is Jesus speaking to us about how we live. How do we walk with Him? He's He's tutoring us. And then as we read it and put it into our mind, he's inside of us and he brings it back to our mind. So when we're going about, we don't know exactly what to do. We're learning how to stay in step with him, to walk with him, walking together with him. And it takes some time and some effort because we're so used to, we're so used to doing what we want to do, aren't we? We, our, our, our natural thing is, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to have my little, have my little devotion here. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get up and go about my business. And that, that's missing the point. That's not the point. The point is, is that we have our spiritual breaking of the fast in the morning. And then that just begins this process. It's just a process for us. It's how we live. And we live the, because he's in us. I wish... I so wish that, that I could grasp this better, that we could grasp that literally the Spirit of God lives in us because that's just one of those game changers to know that he's always there, that he never leaves nor forsakes us. We saw last week, he's, he's got all the wisdom and all the understanding we know. I mean, just think about the implications of that. If he's always there, he's not, he's not there uh, saying, well, if you've been good this week, I'll tell you what you need to know. You know, he's, he's not, we may, we may play that game, but he doesn't. So just think, think about walking him. We can walk in him because he's in us. We receive him by faith and trust. How do we receive him? By, by grace, by the grace of God and by faith. And so now he says, just learn, learn to walk in him. That's where, that's where, that's where it really gets, I mean, salvation itself is amazing, but, but it just gets, it just gets so much better when we just learn to set aside our agenda and embrace his agenda because his is always right. He's always within us. And we can learn to walk with him. It takes some time. It takes some practice. But we can literally learn how to do that. And what you'll find is, is, that, is that you have a greater sense of peace and a greater sense of, of, uh, of understanding about things. Uh, uh, I just read, uh, in January, I read A.W. Tozer's book, The Knowledge of the Holy. We have a group of young leaders that's reading it right now. And uh, he was applying this um, omnipresence of God, which means he's everywhere at all times, to that little passage in one of the Psalms that says, in your presence is fullness of joy. And he said, if he's everywhere at all times, then that means I can be filled with his joy as much as I desire. Now, it doesn't remove the problems, doesn't remove the tension, you know. You can have, you know, and it's easier for me to say this, I realize, but you can have the joy of the Lord in the Ukraine right now because Jesus is right there. He does not run during war. You with me? It's a tragedy, it's a travesty. If you don't know what evil looks like, you're seeing it on the world stage right now. But Jesus is in the heart of that. He's right in the middle of that. So well, why doesn't he stop it? Well, if I knew that, I'd probably be on a speaking circuit. I just know God's sovereign. And, and this, is, this, is, this has been our world. We haven't had a conflict like this in a while. We tend to forget this is, this is living in a sinful world. Honestly. It's been a while since we've had a, a war. But you look back historically, this is the norm because evil raises its head up. Men are greedy. They want what they want, when they want it, how they want it. And then, yeah, more. That's right. And, and God, is, God is still sovereign over that. He's right there in the middle of it. All those families, I can't imagine. I talked to our, our IMB missionary in, in Bulgaria. They're preparing themselves for refugees right now. So we can be a part of that. So everybody does what they can do. But the point is, is that, is that you, can walk, you can walk with him in the Ukraine right now because he's everywhere. He's in you. you he, he will not leave you. He is your constant compassion. He's your Lord. He knows what's best for you. He only wants what's best for you. So he just, and so, so part of it is just learning how to respond to his promptings because when the Spirit of God comes to him, he's going to prompt you. He's going to prompt you with thoughts, with ideas, that you know you may not even, you may be just going on and all of a sudden you got this thought to do something. If you're consciously walking with him, you need to understand that's how the Spirit of God speaks to you. 
He may tell you to go do this for so-and-so, and you think, well, that's crazy. Just, just do it. And because here's how I know that, because he says, so walk in him rooted and built up. So he uses two images there, like a tree, you know, be tree with deep roots. So when I say that, uh, Jarrett's favorite psalm is what, Jarrett? Psalm 1. <laughs> that's right. And that, that's that great psalm that reminds us. He said, he said, you'll be like a tree. Remember? You'll be like a tree planted. I'm getting there. Yeah. And he says, he is like a tree, the godly bird. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. And all he does, he prospers, says the wicked, not so much. They're like chaff. So he's given us these visual images. We've all seen these trees. You know, I still want to go to California. What are those name of those trees out there? The redwoods, the sequoias. I just can't imagine. I've seen pictures of those. And I'm like, I'm like, that's Photoshop there. You know, they're just so, mag you know, but the only reason they're able to stand is because of the root system. So he says, you walk in him and then rooted and built up. You know, we've watched John uh, build these two buildings, you know, and we see how much time is spent just the foundation. And you got to get that foundation right. Then you can build on that as high as you want to go. But here's the interesting thing is, is that rooted and built up and established are all things that are doing, being done to you. You know, look at it grammatically. These are things the Spirit of God is doing to you. These are not things that you You participate in this, but these are things that the Spirit of God are prompting you. He is prompting you. He is rooting you deeply in Him. He is building you up deeply in Him. He's establishing you in the faith, and you just need to learn, I just need to learn how to respond to that. We do that by the study of the Scripture, by the, by the prayer, by just day-to-day -day learning to walk with Him. So we have... We have, this, uh, we have this secure foundation, and then we have this steady pace. And it adds, it adds so much depth to your life. Instead of running and doing what you want, and then you get out there and find yourself on a limb, and somebody's sawing off behind you, you realize, I don't have to be there. I can, I can know confidently that he's, he's rooting me deeply in him. He's building me up. He's establishing me because I am in him and he is in me. That is, a, that is an amazing thing for us to think about, to contemplate. Part of, part of our challenge is to think deeply about things, isn't it? Because, because we have... Twitter and TikTok and Chick Chat and I don't know whatever else there is. I don't know. Just start a new one. You know, we're used to these little sound bites. Boom, boom, boom. Little sound bites. But <coughs> listen to a conversation between Philip Yancey and Kerry Newhoff. And uh, Philip Yancey says that we don't have uh, time today to read these four and five and six and seven hundred page books that we We've, we've, we've basically stopped learning how to think deeply. Think about the last time you read anything of significance besides a romance novel. You know, or a Western. Nothing wrong with those. But when's, when's the last time you read something that caused you to think deeply? And we just, we just run, 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 you know. It's, it's a discipline. One of my growth goals this year is to read at least one book, one book a month that has nothing to do with my sermons. Just to stop and think. I want you to think deeply about a secure foundation and a steady pace and how that can revolutionize your life, how that can change your whole life. Because he's always, he'll be always renewing you, Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the, just think about, think about every day having the spirit of God within you, renewing your thought process, giving you fresh insights, giving you fresh energy, giving you fresh ideas from him. It's a whole different ballgame. So Paul says, the rest of the letter is about this. How do we do this? Because he knows that's the key. For all of us. So we have, we have a secure foundation, a steady pace, and then we have a, a solid attitude. That's the last thing this morning. So he's building us up. We're still in this one sentence. Establishing the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. There's, there's the attitude. That's a spirit-prompted attitude. He told them basically the same thing 
Back in chapter 1, verse 11 says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So he says, here's, here's a solid attitude, one of thanksgiving. In your toughest moment, you're still his child. Thank you, Jesus, that I still belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you're still right here. Thank you, Jesus, that you have all the wisdom and all the understanding, all the strength. You have everything. Thank you, Jesus, when I don't even feel like I know you, you're still here. Thank you. I want to thank you for that. And when we begin there, and we get down that low, and we will, we begin right there. We begin to work our way back up, and it changes your whole outlook. I can just tell you this. Nobody wants to be around a grumpy person. You know that? Husbands, wives, kids, nobody. And, and the thing is, is that it's a choice we make, you know? I've, I've, uh, I've told Mary, I said, I don't want to become a grumpy old man. You know what? Sometimes old men just get grumpy, you know? <laughs> I have a feeling they were grumpy young men, you know. So I'm just determined I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a happy old man, you know. And because why, why can't I? I have, I have more than I ever I could earn or achieve. I have what I've just received. <laughs> you need to write that one down right there. And, and, I, and I will never get over that. I don't want to get over that. Sometimes I think the problem is we've gotten over it. We forgot thinking about it. We just take it for granted. Like, you say, yeah. <laughs> Spirit of God, yeah, he's there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, God himself lives in you because you've received him and he's teaching you to walk. He's rooting you and building you and establishing you and he gives you something to be thankful for, to be thankful even for the problems where you can see his mighty hand at work with thanksgiving. That's a solid attitude right there. That's a solid. Y'all heard that? Well, that's a solid. That's solid right there. There was a young lady that Mary taught in Foster Academy, and uh, she didn't know how to receive a hug. You'd hug her, and she'd stand just like this. <laughs> and after a while, Mary would take her arm. Take her arm. Yeah. She just didn't know how to receive a hug, you know. It was kind of funny. I don't know if she still can do it today. Uh, Friday night we were watching some news and, and they, uh, they, they showed this story. Um, it was uh, about a guy in, in Par, Pargould, Arkansas. I have no idea where that is. I don't know where that is either. <laughs> Somewhere north of here, Eight, eight years ago, he had a massive stroke and he can't use his left arm. And they asked him, says, what is, what is the thing that you miss the most? He said, I miss a two-armed hug. You know, he couldn't get up there. So his daughter was an occupational therapist at the Arkansas State University Hospital. So her and some co coworkers um, fixed this adaptive piece of equipment. And what it was, real simple, it was just a little band around his hand that he could slip his hand in another one. He could raise his arm up like this. He has grandchildren, and he had a, one grandson was born after his stroke. He had never hugged him. And so he would lift his arms up, and those grandkids would get underneath their arm, and then he would, he would pull that left arm in, and he'd get a two-armed hug. And he just began to cry, especially that one he never even hugged. See, he was given a hug, and those kids were receiving a hug. See, God loved us so much that he has opened his arms to us. He says, I love you so much, and I'm sending my only son, that whoever just believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and John 1, 12 says, but as many of them as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And so many people are standing there like this. They see his arms. They know what he says. They know about him. They, they're familiar with him, but they've not received him. Their arms are by their side. A hug's not a hug till you re receive it, is it? Nope. You and I have a lot of friends who never received Christ. And, and we need to know about this secure foundation. 
And we need to know what he's doing in us, our pace of life. And it's not our pace, it's his pace. And, and, then, and then know how we live, our solid attitude. That's, that's who we are. That, that, my friends, is attractive to people. Just simple being in a good humor, good mood through the day is amazingly attractive because most people are not. So, Father, we thank you for the goodness that you show us, for the kindness that you show us, for the patience that you show us, Lord. And this morning, we, we're planting our foot with Paul, and we're, we're, we're pivoting here, Lord. And I have no doubt there's somebody here today, Lord, maybe two or four or ten, that know that you've outstretched your arms of love to us, but have yet to... Maybe yet to receive that. What a, what a beautiful moment it will be today when they return that hug, when they acknowledge their sin, when they repent, when they give their life, give your life, give their life to you. So be praying this morning for a few moments. The altar is open. Praying for our, our friends, Christian friends, and all the folks of the, of the Ukraine. Still have some folks that are sick. Bob Dumas is having a little surgical procedure this Thursday. So if you all are over there by Bob, would you all just pray with Bob? This morning. Eddie Martin's brother died this past week. Have they got arrangements yet, Eddie? Have they had arrangements for your brother yet? They have arrangements for your brother yet? Yeah. No? Yeah, he, he needs cremated. Okay, all right. Passed away. Do you remember Eddie? Anybody have a prayer concern we can pray with you about tonight? We, today we'd raise your hand. We'll have someone come and pray with you. as a congregation about our passion today. We're praying about our purpose of the Great Commission. So if you take just a moment and either read it in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, or if you know it, just pray that back to the Lord. Help, ask him to help us to be a people on purpose. We have a reason for our life. Pray for the one that you're inviting. Pray for the Lord to show you the one. Make sure those of you are online with us that you have, you're praying the same thing with us. If you have a prayer request, if you just share that online, we'll be praying for you. James is back there. He, he'll hear your request and he'll pray for you. We'll be asking our deacons and our deacon associates to lead us in prayer. These are in this time. Cody's going to pray for us to be a, a people of passion and pray for us as we, we find that one to invite. Would you pray for us, Cody? Yes, Father, we just, as we bow this morning and we talk about purpose, mm. I pray that you would lay on our hearts 
the purpose for each one of us here. Father, help us not to miss in the Great Commission where you said that you have been given authority over all things. Mm. In this unsettled time, Lord, that you are still in control. Yeah. Pray that we take uh, hold of that and take uh, hope in that, Father. We just pray as you told the 11 to go and to make disciples, Lord, that that would be a heavy burden on each of our hearts, that uh, you would give us the boldness and the courage that sometimes we lack, but that we can get through you. We just pray that each day we would have a kingdom purpose in mm. mind in the workplace, in our families. Lord, that's where it all starts in the family, in the home. We just pray that we would raise up godly children mm. that would love you and honor you. We pray as we talk about one, the one, pray that you would uh, lay on our hearts one person to pray for at one o'clock for one minute. One minute doesn't sound like much for, for a busy society, Lord. Sometimes we forget. We just pray that you would make it abundantly clear who you want us to pray for. Amen. That we would give that person over to you. We are unworthy and unqualified, but you are not. Mm. We pray that we would rely on your strength and uh, on your words. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our last song of the morning. More than amazing, he is. He'll walk with you every day. More than amazing. You're the one who walked on water And you calm the raging seas You command the highest mountain To fall upon their knees You're the one who welcomes sinners And you open blinded eyes You restored the broken hearted And you brought the dead to life Forgetting all our sins You remember Forever 
More than enough. You can be seated. He's not just enough, is he? He's more than enough. And he ain't just enough, is he? He's more than enough. Say more than enough. So if you don't have a core values and strategy card, they're at the front table and the back table. If you don't have a 111 card, they're in the both places there. So as you go out this way or that way, you can get you one of them. And uh, looking forward to a great Easter. We're getting ready to, we'll be starting our um, Annie Armstrong Easter offering soon, a couple of weeks. So we haven't begin thinking about that. And uh, we're uh, excited. Our, uh, you know, our, our goal every year is that every family prays about it and gives. Doesn't matter the amount. You just pray about it.